Thanks, Luis, and good morning. This is a special day for us here at the Ford Foundation. The Wired for Change Conference is an outgrowth of our Media Rights and Access program, which is led by the amazing Jenny Toomey here. And while, <laughs> and while Jenny and I will be your guides throughout the day, the topics we'll explore go far beyond one single program portfolio. In fact, we hope this day gets us out of our philanthropic silos so that we don't talk about technology as a program area, but rather as a means to help us pursue justice, expand freedoms, foster creative expression, and facilitate our philanthropic work. But before we get down to business, a couple of housekeeping matters. First, tweeting is encouraged and welcomed. The hashtag is pound wired 4 c and you can find it in your program. Secondly, we are being live blogged by Jillian York of the Berkman Center at Harvard. The blog is live now at JillianCYork.com. And speaking of the Berkman Center, I would like to express the Foundation's deepest gratitude to them and our friends at the Personal Technology Forum this day simply would not have been possible without their advice and counsel. And I must thank the extraordinary, talented colleagues here at the Ford Foundation who have toiled for months to ensure that today is a success. But because today is such a full one, we're going to have to work very hard to stick to our schedule. Now having said that, I want to tell you that the schedule is going to change a little. We have a surprise guest this morning, a great philanthropist and leader whose perspectives on the issues we'll be discussing today reach far beyond the philanthropic sector. The special appearance will alter the times printed in your calendar, but we just ask that you go with the flow, and we'll think you'll understand why. And so with those important matters out of the way, let's get wired for change. It's my pleasure to introduce the first panel, which is moderated by my great friend Omar Wesso. Omar is the co-founder of BlackPlanet.com, and he'll guide a conversation with a very extraordinary group featuring Sir Tim Berners-Lee, Ben Jealous, Yvette Albertinktime, and Robin Chase, all of them distinguished visionaries and social innovators. So please join me in welcoming as they open up our day by exploring the question whether the arc of technology bends towards justice. Good morning. You know that if this were a black event, I would say good morning, and the audience would say, good morning. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Darren's forgotten his whole career. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here. I am particularly excited to be able to talk about this question. Again, my name is Omar, Omar Wasso, uh, to talk about this question of does the arc of technology, does the arc of the internet bend towards justice? And it's a particularly propitious time to be posing that question in the wake of the democracy movements in Egypt. Uh, yesterday, we saw uh, Hillary Clinton give a speech about internet freedom. And so there's, there's, it's, a, it's a very rich time to talk about that. And we have a stellar panel to do that. I'm going to give very quick introductions, ask some questions of our panelists, and, uh, and, then, and then very quickly uh, go to the floor. So to my far left is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He invented the World Wide Web. You sort of don't need anything more than that as an introduction. <laughs> to my immediate left is Ben Jealous, is the president and CEO of the NAACP, the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. <laughs> to one over to my left is Robin Chase, uh, who, is, who leads Meadow Networks, a consulting firm that advises city, state, and federal government agencies about wireless applications in the transportation sector and impacts on innovation and economic development. You may know her, though, as the uh, founder and former CEO of Zipcar. Please welcome Robin Chase. And lastly, Yvette Alberdink Time is the executive director of Witness, an international human rights organization that provides training and support to local groups to use video in their human rights advocacy campaigns. Please welcome Yvette. So there's been lots of discussion about the internet 
as a, or access to the internet as a human right. And I wanted to read a brief passage from Hillary Clinton's speech yesterday and then uh, term, turn to uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee to kind of push on this question of, is access to the internet a human right? And yesterday, uh, Hillary Clinton said, one year ago I offered a starting point for that vision, this vision of, of internet freedom, um, by calling for a global commitment to internet freedom to protect human rights online as we do offline. The rights of individuals to express their views freely, petition their leaders, worship according to their beliefs, these rights are universal, whether they are exercised in a public square or on an individual blog. The freedoms to assemble and associate also apply in cyberspace. In our time, people are as likely to come together to pursue common interests online as in a church or a labor hall. So that's a very compelling vision of how the internet uh, plays a role in our lives and, 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 and why it should be accorded rights uh, that, that maybe historically we've not thought of it, it uh, commanding. And I, and I want to push, though, on this question because it's not obvious to me that we should have the internet as a, as a, a new human right. And so I wonder, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, do you, do you view the internet as uh, requiring or needing some new set of, of protections? Uh, uh, is it a new human right? Well, I think it is. I think it's really important that we think it of, of it as a new human right. And in a way, we also have to realize how different it is from the things which we've been trying to get people all over the world to get uh, developing countries uh, like vaccines and water. So yeah, I think the moment we, found we added the, the, the internet connectivity and being doing, able to do things on the web to a list of things that our kids sort of uh, use to, to grow up with and that we use at, at home and at work and throughout our lives. Yes, we added it to a list of things which we owe to try to get, make sure that everybody else can use in the, uh, in the world. But it's not like water. Uh, th in, in the way, there are some wonderful ways in which information is not like water. Um, we've seen recently, uh, if, if I get water to a village and then it, uh, I get a certain amount of water there, it then ha can be divided up. But once you've got it there, it can only be divided up and drunk, each piece can only be drunk by one person. When you get some information somewhere, if you get information about how to build a well or how to cure a disease to a village, then that can spread. So, so information is potentially very much more powerful. So you, you can leverage the getting information to, uh, to somewhere in a different way. So information is different, but it's also different in that there are threats and, uh, and concerns that we don't really have with water. If you control somebody's water, well, uh, you, maybe you can poison it, but, uh, uh, but you probably wouldn't get away with, with doing that. If you control somebody's access to the internet, then you start to control what they can read. So that becomes very quickly what they believe. If you control their access to the internet, you can control which of these many different possible religious uh, groups they could join, which is what sort of uh, news sources they get to. So you have a huge control over their life, subtly, if you can control their access to the internet. Similarly, if you spy, if you can measure the amount of water somebody's drinking, you know what, you may find a little bit about them, but not a lot. So if, but if you can see what they're accessing on the internet, you immediately get very, very deep insight into their very, very intimate details of their lives. If somebody, so uh, it's very important that not only should the internet be neutral in the sense that I should be able to go anywhere and go and see anything out there that's legal, but also it's very important that when I do this, if I'm a teenager wondering about whether I'm gay, wondering about coming out, wondering about whether I've got a, socially transmit a sexually transmitted disease and, whether, uh, uh, and what it would mean, before I click, on to find out the information I really, really need. It's really important that I don't feel that there's somebody, that I don't know, there's somebody looking over my shoulder who will brand me as possibly being gay or possibly having let that disease. Let me jump disease. in, though. So you, you, you posed a, a bit of a challenge, I think, to this question of the internet uh, as a human right when we think about what are the priorities, particularly in the developing world, right? So, so mm -hmm. for most people, safety, water, uh, sewage, electricity would come far higher on the sort of hierarchy of needs than, than internet access. How do you think we should be prioritizing the internet relative to these other much more fundamental sorts of human needs? Well, that's what I thought. And then I sat down, I was sitting in a log looking across a lake with a, somebody who'd uh, been a missionary, in, well, is a missionary in Africa, and had been to war-torn areas. And, and I was saying, well, so, so it would be hubris of us to imagine that we should be pushing the internet in these areas where they don't even have water. And she said, well, not necessarily. In fact, it's not obvious. 
because she, she told the story of somebody she knew uh, who lived in the village where she, he did get some kind of internet connectivity. They didn't have clean water, but he did have the connectivity which allowed him to get in emails in, uh, in English, which he would then translate into his native tongue. And then he started a translation business which brought money in, significant money by village standards, into the village. And that made all kinds of other things possible. So actually, if you, you can use the, if you can use the mobile internet, for example, in Africa is, is a really interesting basis for entrepreneurism, which can bring in, can raise the economic level, and that can then raise health. So I think, in fact, we have to understand how all these things connect together. And as, we, as we've sort of been to Africa and seen lots and lots of stories and seen very, very different regions, I think it's clear that the way they connect together it's not obvious. It's certainly ob not obvious. It's a straightforward priority. I think it's clear you have to do them all, and you have to do them all in consort. And so that means it, uh, we all have to coordinate. The uh, person who invited me to participate on this panel has been, Jenny has made it a priority to talk about how even in the United States we have a significant divide in access to the internet. And I wonder, Ben, do you see the fact that roughly a third of Americans are not online, the fact that uh, the internet is um, sort of, you know, as, as uh, in the great science fiction uh, writer's quote, the, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, is, is, is uneven access to technology a concern for the NAACP? Do you view access to the internet as a human right? You know, te technology isn't just the context in which we do our work, it's increasingly how, our do, you know, how we do our work. And I guess I sort of have a um, de deceptively long view of, of the, how technology has transformed. I started out my career as a, as a journalist in Mississippi being learned how to, you know, being taught how to compose stories longhand to be handed to somebody who would, who would type them. Um, and then they were laid out using wax. Um, and I may have been the last journalist who was taught that way in this country. <laughs> um, well, you were working for and the Amish press, right? Yeah. Was <laughs> I was working for the black press. And, and uh, the, <laughs> the, the reality is that, that, that changes, uh, many of which we championed as far as desegregation of the media, relevated what was very strong mainstream organ in this country to basically being the Amish press uh, 40 years ago. Um, so the, the Baltimore Afro, was, had a larger circulation than the, than the New York Times in 1920. The Baltimore Afro-American newspaper was larger circulation than, than the New York Times in 1920. It's about 25,000 today. And it's important to have that long view and to understand it because what you realize is that the, the, the context, uh, if not um, tended to aggressively, can have tremendous implications on the future. Uh, the, I'm sure that the owners of the Afro really thought they had a bright future in 1920, and they would be as dominant as the New York Times is today, but things change. The, we, still ch we still fight uh, with the federal government over postal rates for black newspapers, because we've never actually gotten full access to the postal system for black newspapers. They pay a rate five, sometimes 10 times more than the junk mailers do, because they mail less volume. And so it's in that context that coming into this job, looking at, on the one hand, uh, uh, being very engaged in, in, in getting the association up to speed and how it uses technology to champion human rights and having some victories like viral uh, voter registration drives that we uh, tried in 2008 that now will probably be the norm by, by 2012. Uh, we were on the first to trying to adapt technology that, that works uh, Ushahidi very well in the rest of the world, but we have actually severe limitations here. We're now beginning with Congress at humanitarian exceptions very frustrating, to finding all of a sudden all this conversation about the net and now our conversations when we were at IDEO last week uh, looking at reinvent, reinventing the oldest black magazine in the country, the Crisis Magazine, and everything is going towards mobile. So that's changing fast. And then on the other hand, um, you know, we're still fighting for broadband, we're still fighting over postal rates, and there's a whole new crop of issues. So, so it, how do you prioritize among all of that? Well, you you've got to struggle to be both in. And what I've started doing is engaging my colleagues who, who lead civil rights organizations in a very frank conversation about the quality of our advocacy uh, in this space. Because it has, um, you know, historically, 
uh, uh, we have not really either sought to, to uh, use our own resources or, or partner with others to really get out ahead of the curve. And we find ourselves basically in a vice grip of, of entrenched interests on the one side um, who just sort of tried to completely overload what is, at the, the end of the day, a fairly um, small group of activists. And on, and on the other hand, it com communities with huge needs that are layered on top of each other. And where the best organized voices are actually the ones who represent the oldest technology. Right? So black radio and black newspaper, probably the best organized, and that's probably six advocates in, in all of Washington. Um, and black bloggers are still, you know, you know, are organizing, but don't really have that sort of lobbying force. And, and that's something where we just have to d decide to constructively engage, decide this is, is serious, and then get serious about it, and then actually realize that, that we, um, have to be del 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 deliberate and intentional in that conversation in the age of the network pressure. Right now. So, so one just quick, uh, so, so the, the, uh, the title of the panel is Does the Arc of Technology Bend Towards Justice? And I wonder, do you think there is something inherently progressive about technology? Is technology um, sort of inherently producing more good, more justice? You know, yes and no. I mean, you can look at Egypt and you would want to say yes. Right. You can look at the way that uh, death threats to my volunteer leaders spike when Glenn Beck goes off on a weird tangent. And you, and, you, and you might say, no, the reality is is that the net is the town square. And your hope is that the people in it, your faith when you lead popular movements, is that the people in it, given access to it, will bend the arc towards justice. But to have faith in the technology itself is like to have faith in so many bricks in the town square. It's not... It's not the bricks, it's, what's, it's, it's, it's who's on them, it's, it's, it's who's in there, and that's why the fight for access is so important, and that's why it feels so anachronistic to be in this role, because you're fighting for a community that's never really had full access to start. Yvette, you are involved in trying to give people access to technology to fight for human rights, and I wonder, how do you respond to this question? Is uh, Does technology, does the arc of technology bend towards justice, and should we think of access to the internet as a new human right. Yeah, <clears throat> I find it interesting, and I'm actually um, very carefully going to disagree with the inventor of the World Wide Web here, <laughs> 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 um, who actually admitted to me that he had a lot of problems in his hotel room with his phone and his wires, and I was thinking, yeah. Phew, he does too. So yeah, no, I think I think <laughs> <laughs> I think it's possible that the Iranian the Iranian government got access to the internet at the UN Millennium Hotel because it was uh, it was yeah. it was pretty spotty. <laughs> No, what, what I was going to say is, you know, there is a framework for human rights and there, there is a thing called Article 19 and freedom of expression. So I don't think that uh, access to the internet is a new human right. I think the question should be slightly rephrased is, with the advent of these new online and mobile spaces where people want to create good participatory online cultures to share um, materials and to have a dialogue around human rights and social justice, these spaces are not necessarily designed to be conducive to the protection of core values. So in those spaces, the rights to privacy and the rights to freedom of expression really need to be balanced. And, um, and I think that when you look, for example, at what happened uh, in Egypt, is that it's an for us, Witness started by sending cameras all over the world, packaging them up in cardboard boxes. So our original vision was, what if every human rights defender has a camera in their hand, what would they document and what could they change? Now look at what's happening in Egypt. We then realized that just sending the tool, the technology, wasn't enough and that you actually had to provide training and that you had to, and we developed a methodology called video advocacy where it's about very strategic and tactical use of video in a human rights campaign, very often along with other tactics. So to me what's really interesting about what's going on right now is as video becomes much more central to human rights and as people are starting to use these spaces for human rights advocacy, I think the spaces that are being used need to be adapted to become more conducive to human rights. So if you, I looked at the Syrian Revolution Facebook page yesterday, mm -hmm. and it said, there was a whole bunch of Arabic, and underneath it, it said in English, it said, please share your photos and videos for the march that they're going to do in, in, I think, March 3rd. 
And it makes me worried because there is, the, when you have these videos and they show up in the regimes that um, are repressive regimes, mm -hmm. these videos, and you can think of a concept of visual privacy, are used to then track down human rights defenders who sometimes there's a whole new generation of activists out there that may not realize the, the risks. And for some people, these risks are actually still very, very high. Well, it, it, and I think we should be clear that those risks actually are here. Here as so, well, yeah. You know, yeah. one of the problems when you use uh, video in police brutality cases is that yeah. they actually use it to track down who got the video. Yeah. And we've seen, of course, you know, the attempt up in Boston to actually say that you're invading an officer's privacy if you videotape him on a public street beating a public, you know, a, yeah. a citizen yeah. Yeah. in public. Yeah. So, so there's, there's I, I think it's, it's important to reckon, you know, to really bring what you guys are doing back here. Because yeah. yeah. it started here with Rodney King and it's yeah. changed the entire world and we've got to be aggressive about yeah. actually, and, and protecting people here. Yeah, actually, absolutely. You, you have a video that you, you wanted to yeah. show. And in fact, actually, the Rodney King incident, uh, Witness was originally founded, and the thing that really galvanized Witness was the Rodney King incident, because I think it was the moment that when somebody was just in the wrong place at the right time and filmed from his window in LA the beating of a person by policemen, it just put police brutality and the handicap on the map. And the same is currently happening all over the world. So I think, yeah, I, think you're, I couldn't agree more. We can look at a quick video, maybe. Can we cue uh, the video from Witness? This um, is, an, is a video from 2006 uh, in Egypt where a man is being beaten up by the police in Egypt. So if you will, this is one of Egypt's Rodney King moments. Um, there's a couple of things that are very important about this. For years, the human rights organizations had been reporting on the excesses and the police brutality in Egypt. So for me, this is at least uh, one key example why video can be such a catalyzer in really putting the spotlight on human rights issues. Secondarily, this video was actually filmed, assumably was filmed by the, the, the perpetrators themselves. So what you see right now in, a, in, a, in an area where video is ubiquitous, this was one of the other policemen who actually f filmed this. And then kind of like what happened with Abu Ghraib, these videos were leaked to a number of bloggers. And the reason I'm using an, an, uh, sort of an old video looking at what everything else is <laughs> going on in Egypt right now is this surfaced in 2006 and the reason it came out is because there was a very small group of activists and bloggers including someone called Vail Abbas who actually were extremely brave and used the web to get this information out there. So when people think that technology in itself is just gonna create moments like that in Egypt, this was what happened in Egypt was first a number of very brave people at a lot of personal risk who actually took the risk of exposing this and working very closely together with human rights organizations and with human rights lawyers and with community organizers very tactically and strategically campaigning. So it's a combination of very tactic and strategic work with technology. And then lastly, I would say, and this is where, it, where, where the point around these spaces that are not conducive to human rights comes in, is that this video originally by these bloggers was put on YouTube because that's the place where you go, that's how you get this stuff out of the country. And it was taken down by YouTube after it had been embedded in hundreds of blogs and it actually had become a very good tool towards advocacy and campaigning for justice. It was taken down because the YouTube censors, the YouTube um, terms of service simply say you can't show violence. So here you have a space that actually doesn't have a separate way to deal with very important human rights video. And in the meantime, YouTube has actually started to correct some of that. But as long as the 
the standards and the terms of service of these platforms are not able to deal with these kinds of videos, this is exactly uh, what's going to happen. Thank you. Robin, you've been an entrepreneur trying to take some of these innovations to the market, try to sort of adapt uh, new technologies to change people's behavior. So I wonder if you can tell us a little around this question of does technology, the arc of technology bend towards justice. On the ground, how, what kind of impact have you seen with technology? Does, does technology arc towards justice? I love that, the concept, and I was thinking of what Tim had said, and I feel like the internet for me is the most powerful, powerful and flexible tool of all. So I, if I were to give someone one thing after I had fed them and clothed them and given the water, it feels to me the internet is so incredibly powerful and flexible. So around this environment piece and behavior change, if we think of our energy consumption and transportation patterns, they have been the same for transportation for the last 100 years. And similarly with how we think about and consume energy, what the, the internet has enabled is that we're able to collect data in real time, which means we can manage it, that we can price it dynamically so when it's congested or um, we can break it into smaller pieces, and then we can do this sharing and more efficiently use, use energy and transportation. And you can only do that when you have the internet that can allow many people to share a scarce resource or to access it in, really, in real time very easily. So I, I do have a slide, two slides here, of the impact that Zipcar did which we took these cars and we're now letting people use them in a totally different ways than they normally did. So if we can see this um, slide, I was, this is data from um, Zipcar's uh, website that I have just manipulated. So right now there are 530,000 people who use 8,000 Zipcars parked in 8,000 parking spaces. That is as opposed to 530,000 people um, using another 100, 112,000 cars were not bought because of Zipcar, and they were not, we didn't need 336,000 parking spaces to fill those, to, for those cars to go around. In Boston, San Francisco, New York, and DC, there are palpable 8 to 10 percent reductions in car registrations and parking spaces required because of Zipcar. What is really remarkable is when you, um, because people are paying by the hour, so we're now able to in the olden days, like most of you, <laughs> you have a lot of sunk costs with transportation. Zipcar was able to bring those fixed costs and make them fully variable, which meant that people drive very carefully and precisely because they're going to pay 8 to $12 an hour to do it. The result is this reduction in um, gas consumption per person. And this 1.16 million metric tons of CO2 that were not emitted last year because of people <laughs> not driving uh, as much, is enormous. And then if you click the next slide, well, how enormous is that? And so we always think, what is the context? How much is a million metric tons? And I was shocked and proud to realize, not as proud as Tim, um, but I was <laughs> proud to realize that uh, one million metric tons is a week of New York City CO2 output. That is astounding for this one tiny company that started 10 years ago and is still growing. And without the internet, I can categorically say it would not work because you could not share this resource so carefully. We couldn't be dy pricing dynamically and we also couldn't have reached out to those people. All of this, if I had had a restricted internet access, if it were a walled garden and I had to pay money to get in there, clearly as an, an entrepreneur you can't get in. So the internet is just a flexible tool. I happened to use it for something that no one had used it before and I competed, I didn't have to ask permission I could get online because I could. There was no one blocking me. I didn't have to compete with advertising dollars against Ford and GM in terms of paying someone to run to, to be able to access my stuff. And innovators absolutely need free, low-cost, powerful tools to show their cool new stuff. So I, I look at it and I think particularly, I guess all of you guys have different issues. <laughs> For me, it's energy and environment. We absolutely need this critical new tool that is so powerful and flexible. We've tried so many other ways. This is the most important thing I know how to do, and this is the most important tool. 
and Zipcar would be an example. It's a great example. Um, but you raised an interesting point. I want to put this to all of you, and then I'll ask one more question, and we'll go to the floor. You, you mentioned that nobody stopped you from doing that. You, yeah. you, there wasn't uh, a law or a state or a you know, entrenched interest that blocked you from doing that. And, and in a lot of the world, there's very much a, you know, a state power or some sort of um, you know, proto, you know, sort of a, a arm of the state that would block an innovation like yours or would block, uh, you know, I mean, not just uh, videotaping in Boston, but, you know, videotaping anywhere. Um, and, and so, so I, I, I kind of want to come back to this question of how, what's the priority of the Internet relative to other sorts of things? Is, should we be focused, when we're thinking about human rights and social justice, should we be focused on producing, you know, sort of supporting good government, or should we be focused on supporting good Internet access? Or both. I mean, the, the you know, we have to be. Pick one. Pick one. No. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> no. The, the, um, you know, the the I think one of the things that's come up here, and I think that we have to take seriously because we're we're quick to act like human rights issues exist somewhere other than here, and not pay attention to the ones that exist here, and we have to be. Uh, vigilant here, yes, absolutely, you know, uh, in fighting to make sure people have access to technology. But we also have to be, make sure that that technology is not used to actually squash their human rights. It's not just Boston. You know, it's not just northern Pennsylvania where, where, where we had the cops track down an activist who had videotaped him, threatened th them with, with all sorts of, of prison time and crimes that actually weren't real. Um, and the guy very courageously said, actually, it was my brother, and he left for Australia yesterday. So you have to track him down there. But you know, th that was just, you know, you know or, or Georgia, where we had three black teenagers attacked off campus um, because people thought they were gay. And then their school kicked the victims out of the dorm, so they found out that they were gay, because on YouTube, they were being beat up for being gay. Mm. And so you know, the reality is that we have to take seriously um, you know, you know, or all the ways, like you know, talking about the, the uh, YouTube with the anti-violence um, blocking, or, you know, or the fact that that uh, um, uh, you know we have, you know, that that you Shahidi is easier to use in Kenya than it is here because the anti-spamming provisions. There's no humanitarian exception. We have to deal with both because if we just have access to it and we let the corporations run wild with with limiting, then the corporation is the new state. So, so, so one very important response that this is human rights issues are a priority in the United States. Um, but that also brings me back to we need to think about how the government is a barrier to freedom and, 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 and not just technology access as a barrier to freedom. So I, wanna, I, wanna, I wonder, is, is, you know, should we be prioritizing governance more than technology in, in our advocacy, in our, in, a, in our social justice efforts? I think that you have to uh, n not just do both, but you have to do them in combination. So you have to understand that governance <coughs> when it's, it's now going to happen on the Internet. So even if you plan to have a nice government on, which sits there in Washington and uh, administers things about the Internet, that won't be what happens. What happens is the space will be filled in and throughout the internet, people will be creating systems of governance. So Wikipedia, with, uh, we're just talking about WikiLeaks at the moment, but Wikipedia was a nifty idea, uh, but they started off with this utopian idea that, that anybody could edit, and incredibly, when anybody could edit, actually it became an amazing resource, mm -hmm. but there were a few pages which were contested, and a few pages where there was just a ridiculous battle broke out. So that they, then they realized, oh, we need to have some sort of process, and so suddenly they start making, Invent, but they're inventing then their own governance systems that from scratch, more or less, starting from the other end, starting from this utopian free-for-all. They're now saying, oh, we'll have to introduce a few, uh, a, a little structure. We'll have to differentiate between people, the people we really trust and the people we actually don't trust and all the other people we kind of trust. So maybe all over the web, there are communities who are doing this. They're starting off new and start forming new ways of governing themselves. Maybe that's really important because maybe the way we have of governing ourselves at the moment, which is designed for very much for, for the geographically constrained uh, systems where, people, where you send a local representative to your national government, maybe those don't scale. Maybe we don't, ha we don't know how to govern ourselves generally, never mind government, but governance. How, we don't know how to make society work, allow kids to find out on the internet what's true and what's not 
figure out what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And so, we, uh, so I think we have to be very creative and we have to just do research. We have to try things out. We have to have lots and lots of students at any one time thinking about how we could organize ourselves better now we got the net. Yvette? Yeah, um, so I think what's really essential is a new approach and it's involving policymakers, it's involving the businesses, it's involving uh, the NGOs and really looking at cross-sector solutions. So for example, um, for us at Witness that means uh, engaging with technology providers. It means, and there's actually a little slide about that, but it also means um, working with developers because there are a whole number of amazing developers that actually could come up with autonomous tools and solutions that can make spaces safer and that can make particularly uh, in the US that can just uh, create, uh, protect privacy or create uh, better human rights advocacy. Um, Actually, this, isn't, this is the other slide, but it's not a good example. So this is a campaign we did in the, together with our partners, AJDK, in the eastern part of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And it goes a little bit to the point of that each situation needs its own. You have to adapt to the local level of technology. And you have to combine technology with other forms of organizing. So this was a campaign to demobilize uh, child soldiers. and. There was a video that was made in which child soldiers talked about their experience and this video was shown in Eastern Congo, Congo to educate and to raise awareness with families not to volunteer their children uh, into the militias. Um, this was done with a white sheet uh, and a generator. However, when that case, uh, one of the um, uh, militia men was actually arrested, Thomas Lubanga, came to the International Criminal Court in The Hague uh, the person who runs uh, this campaign at Witness is a guy called Bukeni Warusi, who's a Congolese human rights activist. He started vlogging to make sure that the information about this trial actually got out because it wasn't covered very well by the mass media. So I think it's always a combination of tools. This is an example of a, of a we've, we are starting something which is uh, sort of a, a, a Witness Labs thing, which we're doing in collabor collaboration with the Guardian Project, which again is a very useful thing to do for us as a human rights organization to work together with very smart developers. And we're working on a tool that is a face blurring app so that when you now have <coughs> made a photo or, or hopefully soon a video that actually is capturing someone's face, you can then blur that person's face before it gets uploaded into, the, into YouTube. And I, mean, I have no qualms that people will still, under a certain set of circumstances, upload videos without doing this. But the point is that when this option is there, you can start to sort of set a standard for uh, privacy, and in this case, visual privacy. So, so these last few uh, responses raise another sort of interesting question. You're talking about kind of applied, on the ground, implemented solutions, and I wonder, what do you think of, as, I mean, put it in, uh, in, in really sort of frank terms, what should philanthropists be doing? What should smart philanthropy be doing to support technology in the interest of social justice? One thing is that, is that there, there needs to be a focus actually, not just on the government, but on what corporations are doing. There's a lot of goodwill that can be leveraged. And a lot of the problems we deal with, like the one that was brought up about YouTube, uh, are not people being evil. You know, it's just not thinking about the implication when you say no violence uh, means that, that you can't, you know, put up something that's that's bad, but you also can't put up something that that may save somebody's life by exposing a, a perpetrator. Um, you know, and similarly, you know, the fact that that it's it was easier to use Yushahidi to respond to Haiti than it was, um, uh, you know, to to some uh, disasters here in the in the U.S. When you sit down with the people at Verizon and you talk about it, they're like, oh, well, you know, we can fix that. They really need to, because, you know, as, as the founder of the net said, the governance happens on the net. Like, what the, the government is doing is usually lags behind, is often ignored, and is tough to enforce. Actually, engaging the people who actually write the rules for the net every day is very important. Other, other answers well, to what I, philanthropy should well, be doing? Obviously, I always put very high on the list, uh, maybe because I just spent so much of my life doing it. They should all, you should all be wearing it, whatever field you're in, you should make sure that if, they, if you can have an, if you can, do one little part in the, in the important job of prevent, making sure that large corporations and governments do not control people's access to the internet and they do not spy on people's access to the internet, then I think that is just, I will put that number one. There are also uh, you know, masses of other really exciting things we can do building on the internet, something that I've been passionately involved in for the last two years 
is, uh, for example, open data. Uh, so I gave a TED talk about it, and I've been working with various governments putting the government data. So transparency is part of go government data on the web, but, but uh, there's a movement which I'm trying to get just ma make sweep across the world of people, everybody who has data, who, who a scientist, somebody working in government, uh, somebody who's got data on their machine, which could be added to the big world set of knowledge out there. So we, uh, we're getting more and more data. We need tools. We need to build uh, free open source tools so that people, uh, so anybody, any journalist particularly, can go and use this data out there, can very um, drill down into it. it. Using the data, it's not just about government spending and transparency. It's about understanding really where we are with the ecology of this planet, getting a snapshot of really what's happening, of understanding the connections which happen between different pieces of, of, our, uh, of our society. And it's about having metrics for all the things we try to achieve in the world. There's actually one of the things that we found is in Africa, for example, millions of anecdotes, but actually very little in the way of, me of actual metrics. So one of the things that we, I like to see people using the web for is getting data back. And when, as we get more and more data back about the real state of affairs, I want every journalist out there to have a really nice, powerful, free tool that allow, that, that, uh, you know, that allow them to really explore it and really understand what's going on and explain it to everybody else. R Robin? I'd, I'd like to add, you know, we think about the internet and all the fabulous parts of it, but there's access to the internet and the devices that access the internet. So spectrum policy is really critical and communications protocols, the cost and types of devices and their openness, their flexibility. We can see the explosion on smartphones of apps and developments because people could get in there. And if we see the, uh, how Wi-Fi, there's a huge amount of innovation on Wi-Fi because it was a piece of open spectrum versus closed spectrum. So we need to make sure that there's as much space is left open that devices are open, that we have, and we think about these communications costs, what is the cost of accessing the internet? I would say what philanthropy can do and is doing to some degree already, but could maybe do better is not think about technology as a separate thing, like it's an integrated thing in any form of social change or human rights change, and, and that goes beyond funding the, the shiny, sexy tools, it, you know, it's, it's also around just what would be really helpful for many projects is to have, if every grant came with a capacity building piece that actually had a developer for that organization, even if you're a small cultural organization in St. Louis, it doesn't only have to be around security and repressive regimes, I think that would be extremely helpful. And the other thing is funding collaborative uh, projects where, so there's a project right now where a number of human rights and activists uh, organizations and activists have gotten together and just to look at security, which is a huge issue for many activists, that kind of collaboration is much harder to fund. And they're just examples of, uh, for example, students for Free Tibet who started working with a developer early on and the moment he walked into their organization said, you're doing a lot of really good stuff, but please unplug your computers because the, the Chinese government is looking at everything that you're doing. And they have now worked together for years. And as a result of that, there are trainings that include security, but also include tactics. Uh, so it's about enabling that long term. And then sort of a geeky point is that there's lots of really interesting data out there around funding and 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 sort of what you can do. So to me, what would be interesting, which is something that the Foundation Center has started doing, is really mapping where is the funding actually going and, and how, and making this data it, to the point of transparency much more available to people, also people who don't have access to it. Let's go to the uh, floor. Are there questions from anyone in the audience? So we've got one in, uh, on the left there, my left. Hi there, uh, my name is Art Brodsky. I'm with an organization called Public Knowledge in Washington, D.C. And I want to pick up on something that Sir Tim said a minute ago. And pardon me if I express a little bit of frustration when we talk about internet freedom. Right now, this minute, where I come from, there are politicians at a hearing who are introducing legislation who frankly don't care about internet freedom. They want to tell a vet you want to start a zip car? Gee, we've got to deal with Ford. Maybe if you only offered Fords. Or, you know, we've got to deal with GM. We don't think we like this. 
This is real. This is happening right now. They're going to introduce it next week in the House, and it's going to pass. And we're there in two or three votes of getting it passed in the Senate, which would take away um, even the, the feeble net neutrality things that the FCC has put in place. And so your question? So my, I wanted to set the stage, because I don't think people, re I mean, when we talk about internet danger, it's not just Egypt, it's here. So here's my question. Do people realize that what is going on now is not just the fight of our little public interest groups and those of us in the tech biz, to feel, see, realize this is yours, and if you don't get involved, then you are going to, you know, suffer with the rest of us. Thanks. Anyone want to? Anyone care to respond? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you should. You didn't mention what the bill was, and where people and the, the website people should go to uh, to, to make. Um, Uh, the bill, there are a couple things that are happening. There's, there's going to be uh, an amendment to the continuing appropriations bill, and there's going to be what's called a resolution of disapproval, and it'll be introduced next, introduced next week. Um, you can go to a site called um, theinternetstrikesback.org, and it will give you the tools to make sure that you call your member of Congress and tell them not to vote for this thing. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's in, in some ways, uh, it, Americans are used to thinking of themselves as the most advanced nation, uh, even though in my, uh, yes, in the, my, the cell, my cell phone didn't work in the hotel because just, I guess oh, New York is just overloaded, uh, and the hotel didn't manage to get its internet together very well, so uh, certainly I t whenever I tend to use the words developing country I, and developed country, I tend to use them in quotes nowadays. Um, and certainly when it comes to rights of people, the, uh, the, uh, the, I suspect there is no other country in which which is so firmly in the grip of the large, co large corporations, in which politics is so, serv f so f firmly dictated by the large corporations. So even, uh, and so that may be a problem that America has to fix before it can fix other problems. I don't know. But anyway, if so not, let me, let me push you on that. Who, who's going to fix that, right? Where, I mean, like, like, how does that change in your mind? Well, there are all, all kinds of things. Uh, Connect. So one way is a whole lot of transparency. Just demand to find out where all that money is fl flowing. And I think there needs to be there needs to be a lot of changes in the, in the money that can flow at all. But um, so by the way, it's the Coica bill. You could look that up as, as well as another one you can look up, which will allow even even while the Secretary of State talks about how important it is to have internet freedom, there is a bill which is currently going through the Senate. Which tried, it bound, it tried to go through the Senate, which was giving the president the right to turn the internet off for 30 days without re without reason. So. Uh, so, so yes, the situation is serious in this country. Uh, I think we should all, uh, it's very easy in, in America to focus only on the country, so most of the time I find Americans tend to be, you know, focus very much on national issues and need to be awoken about inter internet issues, but yes, there's no place for complacency. I totally agree that the, the issues at home and when you're worrying about the, the, um, the, ur about, about the rural poor in developing countries, then what about the urban poor in developed countries? They, they may be, in fact, in a more serious situation. Let's go to an, uh, you want to? Yeah, just a real simple, I mean, I think that this exchange is actually fascinating. Uh, the, the, um, you know, we have two issues, and we've got to figure out sort of where the chicken and the egg is, and I think I have an opinion on, on, on you know, which should come first. On the one hand, you have a broad base of groups that do community organizing, that know how to organize, that know how to push legislation stuff who don't really know much about what's, what's, what's happening with the future of media and technology in this country. On the other hand, you have a group of folks who know everything about, and they don't know how to organize, just straight up. And the reality is that it, as much as I would like to believe that, that the broad base of, of, of group folks who know how to organize could just add on media to their agenda, the way that actually works in the dialectic is that the groups that really have the information have to get organizers and learn how to organize and be willing to hire people who can break very complex ideas that are very really simple and just tell you what to do about it. And, and the lack of that really causes me much frustration because you know, the, the reality is that broad-based movement organizations like ours are basically legislative bodies. And if you don't have a set of folks who care about that one issue, the way that this group over here cares about HIV or this group over here cares about police brutality, it just doesn't matter. Great point. Um, 
another question from the floor. We've got uh, two in the middle there. Does someone have a microphone in the middle here, or? Uh, okay. Uh, well, wait. But because because we're recording oh, it, I think it's helpful. the microphone down. Oh, okay, so I guess we're going to go to here first. Sorry. Uh, I'm Bill Ivey. I'm the director of the Curb Center for Art, Enterprise, and Public Policy at Vanderbilt University and former chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, I, I hear two things coming from the panel, and I, I think I'll direct this to Yvette, but I think any one of the five of you really could, could comment on this. On the one hand, there are issues of fairness. We all have com computers that are connected to high-speed Internet, and we all have Blackberries. Everyone should have that kind of access to technology. And I think that can be sort of set aside. There are also issues of social justice, which seem much thornier, which have to do not so much with access to, to technology, but what happens online. And if you were, any one of you, to say what should be the priority, is the priority the fairness, that is just getting access out there, which creates one set of policy concerns, maybe in some ways the simpler ones, or is it really a question of what happens online, in which case the challenges are more complicated and probably are more involved with uh, what public policy does to the Internet in, in terms of protecting Yvette's formulation of privacy and free speech. So I, I, I just wonder, I heard both coming from the panel, fairness and social justice. And I'm curious where you think we should start and where are the biggest problems. I think, um, thank you for your question, but I think maybe that's a bit of a false dichotomy because in the end it is about justice and about protecting human rights, at least from where I sit. So we just have to look at the tools that everybody is using and make sure they become friendlier for human rights. And I think that that involves also uh, looking at government policy. Like if you look at Hillary Clinton's speech, it's very great that she talks a lot about internet freedom and she makes a lot of examples, but there's very little in there to talk about businesses and hold them accountable. And, and so it's a combination of a set of things, I think, that needs to happen on, on various levels that will hopefully make the internet a better tool toward uh, achieving justice and fairness and social change. I think that's, in the end, is really the goal. And, and um, we are going to publish, for example, on our blog tomorrow, I hope, um, a uh, sort of a set of very specific recommendations of what online service providers can be doing towards that. Um, and I think that's just everybody uh, should be, to Tim's point, should be really um, putting the pressure on to make sure that people are held accountable to be trans transparent and, and uh, protect privacy. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question totally. But um, Yes, uh, there are these different levels. There's the, the, the internet connectivity level, and then there's the web content level, and then what happens in the social space. And I think that, uh, that you can't just, you, you need to, I'm afraid we need to address all of them. It's really hard to, uh, to give them a priority. And when you look at different regions in different, in different countries, you'll find that there, that uh, when some of them effectively, you know, some African countries, in fact, everybody's, a lot of people have got mobile access, but there is nothing in their, in their native language. So you really, at the, at the web level, is suddenly a void so that they can, you can show them how to use a browser and they can afford the data plan maybe and then there's nothing there for them to contribute to in their own language so that they, uh, it, it, it just doesn't take off for that reason so they don't even join the social groups uh, and, and so on. So in other places, in other countries, you've got them, they've got certainly plenty of stuff happening in their language but the, 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 the social networking issue. Robert, uh, I, I think that there's a, another level on top, which is how do we control control of the internet, and how do what do we how do we define the internet? There was this question of urgency in this country. There's a huge amount that is at risk with what is the internet, and is the internet? I can get broadband, I can get Facebook, and I can get something else. That that could be easily defined as the internet. So we have these rules are right now being put in front in legislation, the FCC is deciding things, and who is making those decisions, and it's the people who want to have it owned by three people who, who, who decide. I feel like this is an overarching fundamental piece. Um, we've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to move very quickly now. Let's go to your question, then we had uh, one more here, and then we'll come up front. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Eiler Worvey. I work on something called the Indaba Fieldwork Platform, which does some of the stuff that Tim was talking about, getting data out of places and uh, putting it in big open shareable databases. Um, 
But my question is, is about sort of the arc of the web. And when I kind of grew up in technology, this was in the CompuServe Prodigy uh, AOL days where you would have these different services and you can kind of compare whether the stuff you got on Prodigy was better than the stuff you got on CompuServe. And they didn't interoperate. You couldn't send an email from CompuServe to Prodigy and, and back and forth. And that was not that long ago. This was 10, 15 years ago that this was what was happening. And at some point, these companies died. And we got replaced with the web as we know it today, where everybody can talk to everybody. And I see us heading back towards that day very quickly, where, uh, for instance, one example, uh, there's a bunch of mobile phones coming out today that have a hardware button that opens Facebook. It's actually built into the phone that only opens Facebook. And when you're on Facebook, you can't send a message through Facebook to another platform. You can only send a Facebook message. And I just want to know, sort of, do you sort of agree with this analysis that we're, we're heading into a troubled and much more walled space on the web? And if that's a problem, uh, what can we usefully do about it? Yes. yes. I just wrote an article <laughs> in Scientific American about it. Uh, uh, about and Jonathan Zittrain has got a wonderful slide where he shows the original Prodigy screen where you get Prodigy's choice of 16 options for things you can do on Prodigy in a little 4x4 four four grid. And then he says, it takes us all the way forward 20 years to now we have open internet, we have the iPhone, and he superimposes on it the iPhone's choice of, your, you know, of, your, of, the, uh, of the 16 things which Steve Jobs has allowed you to load onto your, your, uh, onto your iPhone. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so yeah, the fact that uh, a lot of people, when they log on, the, 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 the Facebook button sums it up. But, uh, that that uh, I'm afraid throughout the history of these things at different levels, there has been a threat of monopoly. When you have a monopoly, then it gives you, uh, it, it gives you uh, in the end, a lack of innovation, a lack of competition. And the wall gardens of before, the wall gardens of web access. On, there used to be a web, you could get web phones, they were called, but... They didn't actually get to access to the web. They got access to a walled garden, and they died. So lots and lots of walled garden things died. Those companies you were mentioning that had the dial-in things, they fought for a while to be better than the rest of the ragged, messy world out there, and they failed, because the ragged, messy world out there will always be just so much more exciting and, and, and sparkly and uh, innovative. So, my, I'm, so I am uh, generally... Uh, very optimistic about humanity, that it, but I can, uh, that it will end up being very decentralized. We'll end up with a decentralized world. The web works well when it's decentralized. Technology works well. It supports the things that we believe in when it's decentralized. Every time it gets decentralized in any way, then we've got a problem and, we're, and uh, that we've got to, got, to, got to figure out a solution to. Let's go to the next question. Uh, is... Uh, can you hand the microphone oh, back mic to her? Back. Or? It's coming. Okay. It's coming from that side. We need to fix that technology. <laughs> I'm Mary Graham from uh, the Transparency Project at the Kennedy School. In 1994, a radio station in Rwanda urged members of the tri Hutu tribe to kill <laughs> members of the Tutsi tribe. Um, do we need to think about the f whether in 2014, that might, radio station might be Twitter or Facebook. And do we, are we thinking about strategies to minimize the chances that these wonderful tools can be used to violate human rights on a huge scale? And if so, what are some of those strategies and how can some of us help further them? We think about it this really, unfortunately, quite often. Um, you, know, you can go into Twitter and uh, put in the word nigger and see just how many messages flood up, um, especially if there's different news events. Um, and in the association, uh, we're in 1,200 places around the country. A lot of them are places that are still sort of in the 1950s. Uh, and we, uh, as I just talked about earlier, uh, we've seen with Glenn Beck, with Rush Limbaugh, the whole host of folks whose names I just can't recall because there's too many of them, um, uh, them use radio to actually espouse hate, use TV to espouse hate. Uh, and it was just a matter of time until we saw something like Gabby Giffords happen. Because we could see out in the field the spikes in death threats, the calls into our Los Angeles office, the traumatized interns in our uh, DC office in the wake of, of us passing a resolution that the Tea Party uh, um, should disavowed the racists in their ranks. 
and that was driven by radio. It was driven by the net, it was driven by Twitter, it was driven by Facebook, it was driven by TV, and how it was used. Uh, and so we, you know, we, we tend to, you know, the, the Tootsie example is a, is, a, is a horrific kind of monumental example. But it's actually used uh, in a way that impacts people here and there around the country quite frequently. Um, and it's and it's and it's not a foreign phenomenon. And, and getting you know accountability, I sat down with 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 Roger Ailes, um, you know, who's basically driving with TV an entire set of engagement across all those platforms, uh, huge echo chambers, Twitter, that's Facebook, that's 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 everywhere. And his ethics, um, you know, were at the end of the day, you know, similar to that of a pornographer. He was just like, look, I know this is problematic. I know that this guy's crazy, and those folks say things that I don't even agree with. But it, it drives profit. And we have to, that's part of why you hear so much from me and Nevada about, look, we, we, we have to actually hold to account, not just the government, but actually the people who are, who are ma making profits, because they make decisions that have real implications on the ground uh, and force people at the end of the day uh, uh, to live in terror and feel like they can, there's absolutely nothing they can do to, to make sure that, that, that the rules actually support their ability to live a life uh, of freedom. Other, other thoughts on the potential for, at the extreme case, genocide mobilized through social media? I've been worried for a long time about the stability of society on, on the web. And when, you, when, you, when somebody creates a new thing like, uh, like Twitter or Facebook, when people created email, email, for example, worked for a while. It was a good design. It worked a while for among academics who were sending each other mail. And then when it became possible to access consumers, then suddenly spam arrived. And... The, and a huge proportion of the mail out there is spam. And so it's actually burdening down the system. And the system just wasn't designed for those social conditions. Every system out there, a lot of them, in fact, a lot of them have just been designed because they seemed like a good idea at the time. We haven't got people doing what I call web science, looking at, looking at this, understanding connectivity, people, understanding humanity connected as being what we're really talking about. It's not, we're not talking about machines connected. But so we need people to who actually think, you know, that was a really, really important question. Okay, the answer to it is very, very long. Uh, the, you know, will, can, is Twitter, in fact, a force for some truth? I followed the word neutrality while, that, uh, while the FCC was voting. And the thing that, uh, I saw both sides of it. And I'm afraid I was, so they ended up being very disappointed by, the, the, I, whatever I saw, as people were talking about it both ways. So the people saying, huh, net neutrality doesn't mean anything anyway, and anyway, uh, if you, if we, uh, you know, there were people very, very extreme anti-net neutrality views who'd been sold all kinds of stories about what it wasn't, uh, t tweeting about it. And there were, and there were people, uh, and who claimed it, <coughs> but anyway, you know, there were people very much tweeting against net neutrality and very much for it. But they were all extreme. The people who were tweeting for it were saying that Obama was trash because he'd broken all his promises. He was letting us down because he didn't have a perfect net neutrality situation here. Even though he was getting the first net neutrality that had ever been put on, you know, has ever been put out there, it was being trashed by the extremists because it wasn't good enough. And so if you look at Twitter, there was nothing moderate. There was nobody listening to somebody else. So it seems to me that so that, so that medium, yes, it's an accelerator of the extreme. When, and what the things that are, t that are passed on, that are retweeted, <coughs> are the things which really get people's juices flowing. So as a result, that particular medium is it's an accelerator for, uh, for an extreme view. Now, who knows what the blogosphere could be? What happens if somebody tw changes the way blogs tend to work in the way that now they've also become more of an accelerator for extreme views than an accelerator for reason and discourse and argumentation? Next question. Thanks. Elisa Massimino with Human Rights First. I wanted to circle back to the question or the challenge that Luis posed to us at the very beginning, which was, uh, I think, really critical for this day. And that is to define the contours of, um, of where uh, private company interests uh, come together or diverge uh, from those of us who are advancing social justice. You know, a, a year ago, not this speech this week, but the speech last year that Hillary Clinton gave about internet freedom where she announced this, you know, f fifth freedom, the freedom to connect, which was an incredibly powerful metaphor and very easy for companies to get behind. Free, it's kind of content neutral in some ways. And, uh, but I think one of the advances of this 
speech this week was that she gave some content to that, that, you know, she's pointing out that the e Egyptians protesting in uh, Terrier Square were not protesting for the right to get on Facebook. They were protesting for political freedoms and economic justice, and without the content uh, to those, um, uh, to the freedom to connect, it really is kind of a neutral thing. Um, and so we have a situation where, you know, the public square now is being, where people associate and express themselves as being policed by private companies in many respects. And, um, and they are, because of our political system here, largely uh, writing the rules of the road with our government uh, without much input from us. So I, I wanted to just ask if uh, each of you or any of you could identify maybe one place of convergence where we ought to be focusing, where private interests and our interests come together, where we might you know, start from a platform to build a future here. Uh, maybe for starters, um, I think that um, it's really important to include human rights values in some of, some of the policies that govern these platforms. Just to be really practical, what if there would be specific references to, to protecting privacy and, and freedom of speech in the terms of service? What if every um, platform had a human rights desk? So, and I, I think that um, the stuff that Ethan Zuckerman talks about a lot is that these are private spaces, but they're used for public good, and it comes with a responsibility. If your tool is adapted at that level, then there's an actual responsibility to make that work. So I think there, and it's, it's that on the technology side, it's putting tools in the hands of people so they can control these spaces better, and it's a massive education of the user communities, including, by the way, our own community, the human rights community, around the issues with safety and security. There's obviously a real simple one, it's just access. I mean, we, we count ourselves as one of, the, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, um, uh, in a developed country, but we're, we're, we're really, uh, you know, we have developing countries and information deserts all throughout. You know, and the information desert could be at an expanse in the plains. It could be the projects in Philadelphia where they've got broadband everywhere except for there. Um, and I think that's a point of, of convergence. And similarly, with mobile technology and just the development of mobile technology, which has really revolutionized life for a lot of people who live in those deserts. Um, those, are, those are two points. I want to just ask one follow-up question, though, because I've been struggling with this a little. Newspapers in the United States and in much of the world are privately owned, for-profit organizations that are central to a creation of a public sphere. And that seems to have worked pretty well. And so what's different about that private, for-profit sphere that seems to be somehow a bigger threat in the era of the internet than it was in the era of the newspaper? I think it's just a question of uh, this is, there, there's the web has the ability through its speed to just magnify things and to catalyze things. I don't think the essential issue is that different. The newspaper is also a person, and I, I mean, I think that you can point to examples of newspapers where there are points of view being taken that may or may not, I mean, there's a, there's a clear sort of stand, there's further developed policies around, you know, the faces that you show or you don't show, or and those standards have not yet developed in these new spaces. But I don't think it's an essential difference. I just think that um, with uh, Twitter and with the web, things go much faster. Well, I think that, uh, speed is huge. I think also the, the, the reality is, is that we've had centuries to f finally come to some agreement about the basic ethics of newspapers. And we're, you know, in that continuum, this is very early as far as the ethics of the net. Uh, and the net is, is basically an opinion, you know, uh, sort of medium. Um, with, 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 with very few sort of oases of actual fact-based information, you know, it's kind of strewn throughout it. Um, so, so that's, it's much younger and it's much faster. And as a parent, younger and faster makes more dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a, you had a I was going to say, I get people coming to me saying to, uh, almost at the same time, I'm, uh, what are we going to do with all the journalists? Where are they going to do? Uh, what, what, are they going to, what jobs are they going to get next? Because we don't need them anymore because the net doesn't use journalists. And saying, oh my god, there's so much junk out there. How can I possibly determine what is right and what is not right? So it's clear that the function of journalism is really, really important. 
It may not be actually, uh, it, may, it, it may look like a blog, it may look like a, a, a newspaper. Probably it'll look like something which we haven't invented yet. Probably oh, there's wow. some genre out there, and there may be many of them which will interact f of people, of, uh, of the, some sort of thing like a blog, but where there is a, a person who is using their intelligence and their wisdom accumulated over the ages in order to select in a small area what is garbage uh, and, uh, and what is really, really important. And, there will, and that sort of stuff will be syndicated in all kinds of newfangled ways. But that, that role of sorting out the, ch the, 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 the grain from the chaff is going to be, it's kind of continue to be really important. It's going to be continued uh, for a long time to be played by human beings. We had to learn. So it's part of learning the, how to govern ourselves. On the, that's part of why I think the whole uh, sort of governance on the web issue is how to design those systems. Just, Let's go to Robin. Just, speak, but, yeah. just about the intersection of the private sector and where can we find common ground. This ability for something small to grow and become magnified, if the internet is owned only by status quo entities who are doing the same old thing, there's no room for innovation. There's no room for innovation, experimentation, adaptation of brilliant new ideas. We know those brilliant new ideas are almost never coming from the status quo because they're happy with the status quo. And I think, I think there is a bridge, and we talk, there's a lot of talk about innovation in big companies and how they can get at it. And we need to make them understand, or not under, make it sound like I'm, <laughs> we need to make them see the light, which is the reality that it actually does come from small experiments outside of their realm, and then they grow and say, whoa, I never thought of that. Wow, that's an amazing thing. I'm going to buy it. But if they, <laughs> if they keep it in these little tunnels, it can never happen. So this role of the internet as a space for um, experimentation, iteration, adaptation, evolution, it needs to remain its free, flexible self in order to see that happen. And I think the private sector can buy into that. So just uh, to wrap, I wanted to ask each of you, kind of echoing the last question, um, to, to, and coming back to the overarching question, right? does technology, does the arc of technology bend towards justice? What is one example of something that gives you optimism about how the arc of technology is bending towards justice? <laughs> you go. He's looking at you. He's looking at you. The, um, well, I mean, I look for optimism in strange places. I... Um, Last week, uh, I was sitting in IDEO, the office of the people who invented the first mouse for Apple, uh, with this 100-year-old magazine, 102-year-old magazine, trying to, uh, uh, you're beginning a process to really think what its future should be. And where the conversation ended is that it probably needs to be a mobile app, and the mobile app actually needs to be sort of the, the, the primary way that for many people that they engage with the association in all of its complexity. So it's not just about getting good information from journalists. It's not just about sort of accessing the association the way that you do on the web. But it's also sort of being your own W.B. Du Bois or Miss Ida B. Wells and actually gathering the information that we can aggregate up to do our advocacy much more effectively. So you can go in and write your child's school and we can get hundreds of thousands of people, you know, tens of thousands of people to that across the country and actually have a map that no one else has that informs debate in a way that would be quite powerful. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 the, the, I see, uh, uh, I guess, the greatest opportunity in, empower the peop in empowering the people who make it their business to bend the arc towards justice with that technology. But what that means is that we have to not just be focused on the digital divide, we actually have, you know, amongst sort of black folks and poor folks and white folks and rich folks, but we, also, but we actually have to be, the lack of sort of technological facility of the arc benders is a real crisis for us as a human rights community. The, when I'm dejected, <laughs> the internet is for me this beautiful illustration in itself of what I want there to be much more of, which is, innovation happening at the edge, a collaboration of people working together and adding their particular little parts, and this flexible and dynamic path forward. And when I'm struggling with that in any particular sector, I can fall back on the internet and say, you don't believe what I'm saying? The internet, which we all know and love, is this reality. You know, all of us adding our networks and our words and our ideas together, forming. So I look at it and I think if we can keep it in its beautiful form, it, it remains an endlessly 
fabulous touchstone of what's possible. Yvette? Um, yeah, I, I, I just believe that in itself, um, the fact that the tools are in the hands of people locally, and if I see everyone standing up for their rights with cameras in their hands, to me that's an incredibly hopeful thing. Uh, but I, again, that has to be done. We have to work hard to make sure that it gets done safely and effectively, and that it also reaches the many, many places in the world where, where the cameras, where the light doesn't shine. So, so to me, that's, I mean, it's incredibly amazing that people can now document these violations and that the tools are in the hands of the people, but we need to make sure it actually has the impact it should have. Uh, I, I suppose, well, I get uh, every now and again, uh, somebody emails me saying, you know what, I just managed to do X on the, uh, on the web. And the, these are things which I could never have imagined would have happened. When, uh, if I had to pick sort of a recent event, and the Haiti earthquake, one of the uh, famous events for me was the fact that there actually wasn't, the, there, was, the, there were terrible maps of Port-au-Prince. But there was this open street map OpenStreetMap.org is like a wiki map. Anybody can edit it. So if you've got a bit of experience of drawing maps, and, the, and given that there was satellite imagery was immediately released to the area, that people from all over the world just looked at the map of Port-au-Prince and then brought it up with a satellite image behind it and just draw it in. And you can see, if you look in real time, it's great to see a video of the map just being built up by people all over the world. And so within a, uh, within a few days, the map was brilliant. Not only did it have, it had hospitals, and it had places where the road had fallen in, places where it had the, all the earthquake damage, and it had a hospital, which was on a hospital ship, because that's how real time it was that it pulled into the harbor. So that was just amazing to see all this. You know, but on the other hand, in a way, yeah, that was brilliant, uh, but that was, that's kind of like cheating, because you can build a map from remotely. You can't build a hospital remotely. So um, and there were a lot of people who were all geeky mappers, all just itching to have a nice mapping project to do. So, the, the, so a lot of uh, and so you can't build a new democracy very, so easily remotely. But uh, every now and again, there's just a sort of a, a soul filling thing happens like that. What I'm convinced is essential about this is that we continue this the fact that the things that happen out there are not the things we, we can predict. We can even wish for in this room. We create, must create the conditions so that people out there have ideas and bring to fruition ideas that we just can't imagine here because they are so creative and they are so innovative. And they can cr be creative and be in, in, in innovative and do those amazing things when we make sure that the web is this white sheet of paper, that it's a neutral medium, that it's, not control, that it's decentralized, that they don't have to ask anybody's permission to open a new website. They don't have to register a new website, as I, you will have to soon have to in some countries. You, that uh, you, All you have to do is to connect that low bandwidth is cheap, maybe even free, very low bandwidth uh, ideas, and that it's, uh, it's, uh, nobody's spying on what you're doing. Nobody's controlling who you connect to. If we can preserve that, people out there will do amazing things. We are uh, now going to wrap. I, uh, I think we have answered the question in part. Uh, technology, there is, there is an enormous uh, amount of, of innovation that does give us reason to be optimistic. But as we've heard in the last question, there's also enormous reason to be concerned about the process not just being progressive, that law and regulation um, and other sorts of uh, uh, oversight, whether it's government or corporate or uh, uh, from non-governmental bodies, can, can, can move in the opposite direction. So I think uh, perhaps the arc does not bend towards justice unless we continue to fight and, uh, as you said, put our hand there to, to move it in that direction. Please join me in thanking a superb panel.